What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? It is Jake, better known as Star Coding, coming at you with yet another video talking about what other than computer science. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into hash tables because, let's be real, we all use them, but we take them for granted all the time. I mean, all it takes is... Am I right? We got it. Huge. Oh my gosh. What do we do? What do we do? We do the my table. This is what it's all about. Yes! Let's go! Boom. Hash tables. They're easy, right? Uh, well, let's find out. Stick around. Let's answer this question. Oh, man. Here we are. Asking the big questions and answering them. This is bringing me back down memory lane. But what is a hash table? That is a great question. If I were to answer that off the bat, you know, I think it's start. I think it's helpful to start by saying it's an array. It is a solid chunk of memory. Let's just look it over here real quick. You know, we got a solid chunk of memory that's sitting somewhere in your DRAM, in your cache, uh, and it, it has values in it. It has information in it, and that's great. In an array. And arrays are great because they have such quick lookup times. It's a solid chunk of memory. All I need to know is the address uh, and a little offset and I can access that memory. In data structures, that is key. That is, that is quickness. That's what we want. We want that quickness for our insertions, for our deletions, for our looking up and finding stuff. Uh, the only thing that sucks is that <laughs> In an array, I mean, you have to know what this number means. Uh, the zero, the one, the two, the three. Which, if you're smart and plan ahead, maybe these numbers mean something. Maybe these array indices mean something and you can find data based on that. But if, they're, if, if they don't mean anything, you're stuck. You're like, well, I have to look through this whole entire array, this whole entire list to find one item and maybe the thing you want is the very last oh man and you would have to waste all this computational time looking through the array until you found bada bing bada boom this one guy now there are some great algorithms out there that are used for searching in arrays and finding information uh which is great but there's also this thing called <clears throat> a hash table that will solve this issue for us. Let's get the eraser out here. Let's erase this and start talking about a little something else. All right. So now it's time to look at this guy holistically. I'm talking about the hash table now, not just the. Okay, I lost my mouse there for a sec. Okay, we got him back. Uh, we're talking about the hash table here as a whole. And there's three parts. Again, there are keys. Well, there's two parts there's keys and buckets. And then there's a middleman, the hash function, okay? And as y'all probably know, keys can be any object really, custom, string, int, decimal, float. And they're gonna go through this hash function. This hash function takes in any object, like we said, um, and it spits out a int, an uh, integer. So we take John Smith, we do some operations in this black box right now, it's, it's black, we don't know what's going on, but in the future, we will uncover that and it spits out too. bang for as long as that hash function exists. And this as long as the array size doesn't change. Um, John Smith is always going to point to two, which is great. This is what we want. That means that I can look up objects in constant time. I take what I, who I want a key, throw it in this function. It just runs a set finite amount of code and returns me some information and it doesn't matter if you know if i'm looking for the item here or the item here or the item here it's going to take the same amount of time no matter what i'm looking for which is why we love hash tables All right, so to better, I guess, explain, visually explain what I was saying in the last slide when it comes to time and time complexity, we're gonna compare the hash table to the other data structures. 
So we have our arrays, our linked list, our stacks, our queues, our trees, and our heaps, and finally our hash tables. And we can clearly see that the hash table is just a Lamborghini. I mean, it's outrunning everyone in time, and it's crazy fast. That's not to say that trees, heaps, queues, and stacks and all these data structures don't have their place somewhere in the code. You know, depending on what the problem is, you might want to go for these data structures. But if you can, and if it makes sense, the hash table is the go-to solution for your problem. Um, and for those that aren't too familiar with, with time complexities and big O notation, just know that the smaller it is, the better. So n, you can think of a number, you know, 10. Let's we'll say n is 10. 10 is this yellow, okay? Our, our speed is 10. Log of 10 is gonna be smaller. It's gonna be like, what, two, three-ish? So that's gonna be the light green. And if you were to times, um, well, you can't, there is no n, there's just one in these greens. So that's why it's so quick. It went from 10 to one. In, in speed with speed being smaller uh you know yeah <laughs> it's something uh let's let's talk about some some history now whenever i'm talking about a big topic in computer science whether it be data structures algorithms just coding in general we can do so much with a few lines of code for what our forefathers did in front of us in the 1950s and 19 80s and all that jazz. I mean, a lot of things happen to make it to where it is today. So, you know, when we're talking about hash tables, we got to talk about Hans Peter Loon, who is this man on the right side of the screen here. He worked at IBM, as you can see here in the top corner. Um, and he was writing about this idea of arrays and associating them with, uh, with objects. Kind of like, hey, what if we could take something uh, take take something meaningful, compute it down into a number, and have that be the index location of an array. Uh, and he was talking about this back in 1953, which is crazy. Um, and in the in this book, The Art of Computer Programming by Donald E. Newth, um, he talks extensively about uh, these hashing functions and how they came to be and all the great people that were a part of making the hash table a thing so shout out to the forefathers and let's dive a little deeper all right so how does the magic in this hash function actually take place so let's take a look on this next slide um we have a function f function f here that takes in the key our john smith per se uh you know whatever a string object and the array size we're going to hash we're going we're going to use a hashing function on the key wow guys so descriptive look at that oh man we're getting so deep in the code wow <laughs> so we take the hash and you might ask yourself at this point in time wait i'm used to sha i'm used to um md5 there are a lot of numbers that can get hashed um like you know two to the 32 could be the it could be this hash number right here you know it could be a big number so how do we actually get that into the index size well simple question we use modulo arithmetic to just mod this guy and then return the index so that way you can't have a crazy large number that goes outside the bounds of the array it's always going to find its way into the array size um and again, I was talking about this, this SHA-256, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cryptography guy, so all these big um, crypto algorithms that are out there that make our internet secure, I was like, okay, it's going to be something like that for hash tables, right? Wrong. It's actually something simpler. You know, we're talking about speed. We don't care about security necessarily when it comes to a hashing function. We just want our things to map quickly. Um, so it doesn't need to be too crazy. And every language kind of has their own hashing function um, that, that goes into their standard library. This murmur hash is what is used for, you know, the C++ standard library, and it has ports to a bunch of other languages. And I can't say for certain if it's used in Java or if it's used in Go, uh, Rust or any of that, but in C++ it's used, so I'm like, we'll go with C++. 
Um, so very, very cool here. And this is the code. This is the um, pseudocode of how it looks. But, you know, you all are not here to watch me look through pseudocode. That's not fun. So let's, let's break it down um, with this little chart here. So when we talk about hash tables, we say that the key can be any object that we want it to be. And that is because when we're doing the operations on key, it is at a bit level. It doesn't matter what the type is. We're doing it with the object's bits, and that doesn't change no matter what the object is. Um, and the way we do these operations is we have, you know, a key that is arbitrarily big. I think it can be up to, you know, 128, 256 bits long, however long the key is. In this example, we're talking about 32 bits. Um, and we can break that into blocks. In our example, we have four 8-bit blocks. And what we're going to do with each one of these blocks is a series of operations. Now, in particular for the murmur hash, what we're going to do is we're actually going to combine each one of these 8-bits with a variable, another 8-bit um, variable or same length variable. The reason why we do these particular variables, var1 and var2, is because they have some unique trait about them that makes random, abil random ability nice. Um, when you multiply the number by var1 and var2, you know, it gives you a good mix of the variability so that way your hashes are, are different each time it comes through. So we combine it and then we do a bit shit to the right. Um, and when we do these shifts in the register to the right, the it's not like we're losing all of our values. That They actually come back in like a circular array format. So when you bit shift to the right, the ones on the left kind of come back in a big loop. You can imagine a big loop like that is how the numbers end up going. Anyways, that's probably too much in detail. Sorry. Uh, we do that again and again with a uh, different variable. And there are some uh, some other operations that actually come into play here before they get down to the final eight bits. But to save y'all some headaches, <laughs> um, this is kind of the general way it works. We take our eight bits, we're combining it with something, we're shifting, we're taking that value, we're combining it with something else, we're shifting. And there are some XOR statements in here as well. There's some variables that get XORed with our variable, um, again, for the hash ability stuff. But that is going to be the general outline of how this value, or how these keys get hashed into a final integer value. And again, maybe after that little bit of an explanation, pause the video and take a look at the pseudocode uh, and comment below what you think about it. Now there's one final thing we have to talk about when it comes to a hash table. Let me get this as a red pen real quick. So when we're talking about a hash table, you know, we're talking about a solid chunk of memory. Oh man, that's janky. But it's getting the job done, don't you worry. And so we have a block of memory, chunk of memory, and some places where things can get stored. We have entries for our data. These red swiggles will be our, our data that's coming in, which is great. And what's different, you know, what's important to realize about these hash tables is there's no way to determine where that value is going to get stored when it gets put into the hash map. We have a key and it's like, oh, I'm going there because the hash function says so. And that's all you know, it's unordered. The data does not flow in a certain way. It just gets put where it is and that's important because when it comes to hash tables i mean we can have some data that's coming in and bang it wants to go exactly where something else already was what do you do in that situation well it's called collision handling the 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 hash table will go into collision handling mode and it'll do some sort of algorithm maybe chaining maybe open addressing, cuckoo hashing, round robin hashing. There are a bunch of hashing algorithms that exist out there, which is super great. But let's wrap it back to load factor. The interesting thing about load factor is that 
you know, it, it basically dictates how full you want your array to be, how full you want your hash map to be. So n would be the number of entries that exist. We're talking about these guys here, these entries, and k is the size. And as a general thumb, you want there to be, you know, like you want the table to be like 1.3 times quicker, according to a quick Google search. You want you want it to be 1.3 times bigger. Uh, you want to have some wiggle room. You know, it, it depends on what your needs are, um, what the library is. But you want some wiggle room in your hash function for these values to just get randomly put so there's no collisions because that's when things get nasty. So this is when the it all comes full circle in this part. You'll remember that we called these buckets in the first slide instead of like, you know, indexes. And that's because of a collision technique, really, and how the terminology was. But so we have John Smith and Sand Sandra D, and they both hash to the value of 152. What do we do in this situation? Well, in this example, we're using chaining. So instead of pointing to, you know, a value, this bucket is actually the address of a linked list. And because John Smith was there first, he gets he gets first dibs, he's at the top of the linked list. And as people get hashed into the same 152 value, they'll get appended onto the linked list. So this is sweet because the program doesn't crash when both things hash into each other. But it's also kind of bad because technically, if everything was hashing to the same value, instead of having a sweet, fun, sexy Lamborghini of a hash table, you would have a lame Gary the Snail linked list, which I'm not hating on linked list, but come on now. <laughs> uh, so bringing it full circle, we want to think about that load factor because we want a big enough hash table to where all of our elements have somewhere to go and they're less likely to collision and hash on top of each other because that is no bueno. And I want to drill it back a final time to talk about probably the biggest thing when it comes to hash tables that programmers don't necessarily take to consideration. When we talk about the load factor, we're saying that a hash table has to be a certain size for its index values, for the values that come in. At some point, it's going to get too full and we're going to have to regrow our, our hash table. Um, and when we regrow our hash table, that means we have to rehash every single entry that was in it to begin with. So, you know, if I have a 10, a 10 indexed hash table, there's 10, 10 spots to be in it, and I hit the seven mark in fulfillment, okay? It is actually time for me to double my size of my hash table um, because I hit that threshold on the load factor. I will now double my size and rehash all my values. This is a costly operation. And you can imagine if you were inserting elements into a hash table and the hash table had a size of like 20,000, 100,000. And if you were inserting and somehow hit that threshold in runtime code, um, yeah, you would, <laughs> you would blow up the code for like two, three seconds and be hanging as it had to rehash all those values. So something to keep aware of when you're when you have hash maps, when you have hash tables, try to keep them as static as possible, because, yes, uh, they will grow if you insert values into them. I mean, we've gotten to a point in programming where, you know, all these library functions are great. They work. But keep in mind uh, under the hood, under that engine, there is a beast that says, there's there's a literally an if statement somewhere in the beast that's like okay if you hit that load factor double the size rehash and depending on what how your hash table is currently that could spell disaster so on that grim note on that fun interesting note we're gonna say goodbye um and thank you for watching this video subscribe if you enjoyed bye